All right, so we're going to continue this so where we left off and finish up chapter two. We're going to start right here. Speaking of which, all right. Speaking of which, the beautiful Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Washington, D.C. is called St. Sophia or Hagia, which means holy wisdom. It is patterned after the original Hagia Sophia Cathedral in Turkey's largest city, Istanbul, formerly known as Constantinople. That's how important the early Christian church considered wisdom to be. The formative years of Western civilization were shaped by an, a synthesis of the early Greek philosophical tradition and Judeo-Christian heritage that originated in what we now call the Middle East. Islamic philosophers made major contributions in mathematics, natural philosophy, and Platonic and Aristotelian scholarship during the European Dark Age. Each then led to a revival of those interests in Europe at the end of the medieval period. During the Middle Ages, theologians had tended to use argument to support their readings of the Bible. The rise of modern science and modern philosophy ushered in a renaissance of classical literature and classical philosophy. Philos philosophers became more inclined to establish an ethics that is independent of religious traditions based on reason alone. Socrates had already suggested that philosophical ethics should operate independently of religious ethics in ancient Greece. When told that the good is what the gods say it is, Socrates protested that the gods in the polytheistic Greece of his time seem to say different things. Moreover, even if there is one supreme god, as there are indications uh, Socrates might have thought, he asked the important question, is something good because God says it is good? Or does God say it's good because it is in fact good? In other words, using an example, is honesty good just because God says it's good? Or does God say honesty is good because it is in fact good? If God had said lying is good, would it be good? Socrates didn't think so. This suggests that there is a rational basis for ethics, even if one thinks there is a God. Philosophical ethics. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that exercises critical thinking with regard to what is good or bad. It opposes using dogma, whether based in authority, practice, or tradition, to teach what is good or bad. The word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos, which refers to the character of a culture or community. The word morality comes from the Latin word moralis. It is first known, or its first known use was by Circio, who used this term moralis to translate the Greek ethicos. A person's ethic origin originally referred to a person's character as grounded in the the culture's ethos. So moral so morality is derived from the tradition of ethics. They are synonymous terms unless an author says they are using the words to mean slightly different things for the specific purpose the author has in mind. One of the things that logic and critical thinking skills is used for is to reason about ethics. So it would seem that ethics, like every other scholarly field of endeavor, is grounded in logic. The problem with this view, however, is that we have to ask of logic itself. Is logic a good thing or a bad thing? We could say that it's good because it helps us to arrive at the truth. But why is truth a good thing? Why should we pursue truth at all? When we say that logic and other truth revealing activities are good things, we mean that we value them. To value something is to say it is important. This is another way of saying they are good. For these reasons, as, as was mentioned earlier, Josiah Royce argued that ethics is what he called first philosophy, meaning the ground of all philosophy. 
if he is right, all questions of what we value are ethical questions and they come before anything else. But might it also be true that our values are reasonable? We can make sense of them. So this would suggest that they have a logical structure. Ethics is the discipline in which we begin by reflecting on and rationally determining our values. What we value then helps determine what we think are the right actions to take in various situations. Once, or see, one could argue that ethics is the study of values, goals, and obligations, right actions, determined by that value structure. We could compare it to doing a Google map search. You put your you put your destination in and then you're told by a program how to get there. According to classical ethics, we establish our goals or values, the good and right actions follow from that. The biggest question for great Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle became then, what is the good life? Placing such importance on goals means that classical ethics was theological. Plato was, or Plato as well as his student Aristotle argued that we all pursue the good life, but what is the good? Our answer will help to determine how we act in the world because right actions will help us achieve that goal or that good. Some of the way these sentences are written are just kind of incoherent when you're trying to appeal to a, a group that is just first getting into uh, philosophy. Anywho, back to the reading. Plato and Aristotle believed that we all seek Sorry. Plato and Aristotle believed that we all seek happiness. Um, eudaimonia, whatever that word is. Uh, sometimes eudaimonia is unpronounceable, is translated as well-being. And most philosophers since Plato have held some form of happiness or well-being as the goal in life. These translations can be misleading. However, by happiness, he, he did not mean a mood that comes and goes. By well-being, he certainly meant more than physical health, though health is part of it. Idiomonia, I'm never gonna say that right until I actually hear somebody tell me how to pronounce it, is the deepest and best kind of well-being, connected with the lasting satisfaction of being ultimately fulfilled in a good life. And that ultimate fulfillment has to do with fulfilling one's purpose in life. And importantly, that fulfillment and purpose was seen in the context of community, not the TV show. Although that TV show is pretty badass. When considering right action, Plato and Aristotle emphasized a person's character. The focus was on becoming an excellent person in a communal context rather than on rules. So, Plato long ago realized that ethics must involve a theory of the psyche, a Greek word that is often translated as soul or mind. We must, we must know that a person is to know what, sorry, we must know what a person is to know what excellence of character is. Reading is hard. In the allegory of the chariot, Plato says that there are three parts of the human psyche, reason, spirit, and appetites. The chariot is pulled by two horses represented spirit and appetites. The spirited part of the psyche is the ultimate decision maker. 
and it wants to get somewhere in life. The spirited part uh, um, can be pulled by the appetites, which look for short-term resolution of its desired and dislikes, of its desires and dislikes, or it can agree to be reined in by reason in order to achieve the higher satisfaction of more long-range goals. Following the appetites alone will lead to running off the road or otherwise not getting where we need to go. Plato says, if we hope to attain our goals, Plato argues, we need to follow reason, which has the big picture and our long-term interests in mind. This coordination of our lives by having the courage of spirit to follow reason in reining in our appetites was what Plato considered to be a just or good person with each part playing or playing its correct role. It's like, uh, what do you call that? Discipline. Willpower, I, I suppose. Aristotle taught that the best way to live is always a middle way between two extremes. Hmm, not too bad. Kind of a good idea. The middle way is called a virtue, and the extremes are called vices. Note how this theory does not come from divine revelation or spiritual intuition, even if the initial insight might have. The theory is based on reason. We are asked to believe it, not because on authority or tradition says, says it is so, but because of an appeal to our own reason. It makes perfect sense to say that the right way is the middle way between doing too much of something and doing too little of it. Aristotle used the example of courage. Courage is the virtue we should have when confronted with something frightening, but we usually shy away from something frightening. If we shy away too much, we are guilty of the vice of cowardice. If we are overcompensant for this, however, and unwisely rush into a frightening situation without knowing how to properly deal with it, we are guilty of the opposite vice. We sometimes call it rashness. Another example is temperance, the virtue of remaining in the appetites. One vice is overindulgence. The opposite extreme is usually called insensibility, which means an extreme form of ascetism that would involve either not enjoying or almost completely withdrawing from the world of the senses. All right. Well, that's a word. Dieting is one aspect of this virtue of temperance. It involves not overindulging, but good dieting does not involve starving oneself to death either. It is good to find a happy medium, which is the virtue, which is the virtue, the excellent way. Interestingly, Aristotle said that we are like warped boards by nature. We incline toward, sorry, we incline toward one extreme or the other by nature. When it comes to something frightening, let me get back to where I was. When it comes to something frightening, as we already noted, we tend to shy away from it. When it comes to dieting, most people tend toward overindulgence. Aristotle taught that if we want to fix the warped board, it is or it's not enough to pull it back to the center and hope it stays there. It will not. It will spring back in the direction it came from. If we want to get it to end up near the middle, we have to pull it toward the other extreme. It is the same, or it is the same, he said, with learning the virtues. If we want to become courageous, we have to face our fears and that will and that will seem rash at first, 
but that's the only way to gain the wisdom to deal with with that situation and so master the virtue of courage. The same is true with temperance. Dieting often seems extreme to us when we first try it, but that's the only way of mastering good eating habits. I'm not sure I care for the analogies, but all right, we're, we're moving forward. When we face our fears or rein in our appetites with wisdom, some would say we are putting our ego in its place and finding something more like our true selves. In India, this is illustrated in one of my favorite religious symbols called Shiva Natar Nataraja. Nataraja. Nataraja means Lord of the Dance. In this sculpture, Shiva is displaying Lila or Lila, which means something like a divine play. The, the universe, it suggests, should be more like play than work if we can experience it the right in the right way. The, the secret to Lila, however, is expressed by Shiva's foot being firmly planted on the back of a dwarf which represents the human ego. We have to put our egos in their place, in other words, to experience the freedom of ultimate happiness in life. So Aristotle's theory is called a virtue theory of ethics. Aristotle's virtue theory is based on what is called the principle of the golden mean. A mean is a position in the middle of two things. It is the middle way between too much and too little. For this reason, Aristotle's theory is also called the middle way theory of ethics. Plato, Aristotle, and the great Chinese philosopher Confucius all talked about the cultivation of character. Confucius thought that the best way to guide people to becoming excellent human beings is through culture. Notice how the word culture and cultivate have the same root, roots in language. Confucius and the Buddha, like Aristotle, also presented middle way theories, suggesting that the right way to live is in between the extremes of doing too much and too little of something. Confucius thought of honesty as one of the principal virtues that leads to Ren, or the ability to create harmony between you and others in society. So rules or guidance or guidelines can evolve out of this kind of virtue ethics rather than the one or the other way around. When it came to rules, Confucius and the Buddha also taught the silver rule, which says, don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. Sounds like the golden rule. This approach emphasize, emphasizes do no harm, which is a central principle in medical ethics. Hillel, a Jewish rabbi from the first, C, uh, first century uh, BCE, said that the whole of the Hebrew teaching could be summarized as that which is hateful to you, do not unto another. Boy, do they have to make it confusing with their silly quotes. These are called rules of re re reciprocity, as they imply a kind of mutually beneficial interaction. From this silver rule perspective, then one could argue that one should not lie to others because you wouldn't want them to lie to you. See, that's the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have done unto yourself. You know, that that's probably uh, along further in the reading because, you know, some other folks change some things up for their likings. All right. Jesus of Nazareth, a Jewish rabbi of the generation following Hello, when asked that or what he, the most important law in Judaism was, said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. 
and the, a second is like and a second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself much could be said about that philosophy sorry much could be said about that philosophically but first i want to point out that god for jesus represented wisdom much as it did for plato but for jesus the wisdom took personal form the second point is that jesus said that loving our neighbors as ourselves was like loving god this implies that he saw the divine in each one of us and finally jesus was saying to love others like we love ourselves not instead of loving ourselves how can we love others if we don't love ourselves we ourselves jesus seems to have implied must become vehicles for love in the world that's an awkward sentence too the rule of reciprocity as expressed by confucius and buddha was called the silver rule by western scholars because jesus taught a positive form of the rule of reciproc reciprocity called the golden rule which says do unto others as you would have them do unto you it's the same thing again jesus's approach was centered in sorry was centered in the virtue of love the gospel of john even says god is love paul who helped establish the early christian church explicitly argued that jesus had taught that love has priority over the law. From this loving perspective, one could argue that one should be honest with others because that's how you want others to be with you and is the and is at the heart of a loving relationship. Aristotle taught that there are four cardinal virtues: justice, wisdom, courage, and temperance. The medieval philosophers Augustine and Thomas Aquinas argued from Paul and added three more, three more faith, hope, and love. People are generally, um, people are generally agreed that everyone should have a good character, which is the same as saying they should be virtuous. But even if we agree on that, it is not always clear what we should or should not do when it comes to particular actions. We may even agree on the list of seven virtues above, but still interpret them in different ways. These different interpretations then lead to different rules of behavior and thereby to different laws. Even there, however, there is a great deal of agreement around the world about the most important things. It would be difficult to find, for example, people arguing that murder or theft should be permitted, or at least among one's own community. Oh, sorry, should be permitted at least among one's community. Uh. Due to the way Western civilization evolved, there was a strong correspondence between religious beliefs and the law that governed European society so that the idea of morality and rules began to be thought of as meaning the same thing. After the Renaissance began in the 14th century, modern philosophers and their societies attempted to establish a purely rational principle for rule or lawmaking in society. Perhaps the most natural place to turn for strictly secular guidance on lawmaking was hedonism. And that is the route that 17th century English philosopher Thomas Hobbes' moral philosophy took. Hedonism is the belief that the good is pleasure and that, and that which is bad is pain. On this view, honest, honesty is a good policy when it feels good. Maybe it's not so good when it would lead to pain. 
The question that immediately follows the introduction of hedonism in philosophy is, do you mean the pleasure and pain of society as a whole or only that of the individual? Got to make sure I'm actually in the right spot here. There we go. Yep. Should I be honest, in other words, when it pleases me alone, neglecting thoughts of the pleasure and pain of others? Or should I be honest when it brings about pleasure in my social circles, but avoid it, but avoid it, bleh, but avoid it if it brings about pain? There's so many sentences in this book that are just written poorly. I think you can see why this approach would be appealing, but also why it might be might raise doubts. Most of us do not believe it is ethical to lie in order to please yourself at others' expense. Also, it's also problematic to lie in order to keep others in your social circle pleased. What if they are doing something very harmful? Do you lie to keep them feeling happy or tell them the truth? despite their pained reaction to help them further down the road. Hedonism is about short-term satisfactions. So basically, you know, do you lie and say, yep, you look good in those pants, even if those pants make you look fat, you know, just to make somebody happy? That's the struggle. You, eudemonism, eudemonism? God bless this word sucks. Uh, anyways, can't pronounce it. Which was taught by Plato and Aristotle focuses on those long-term satisfactions of achieving a good life. I don't know if there's a thing that'll pronounce it for me. Um, but let's see if this... Says Eudaemonism. It. Eudaemonism. All right. All right, let's get back to where we were. All right, there, there has always been a close connection between ethical thought and political philosophy. Hobbes's main purpose in his political philosophy was to defend the, the monarchy against those who opposed it. In the beginning, Hobbes argued everyone would have a right to anything they could obtain and retain by force. Hobbes speculated that such a hedonistic world would result in a war of all against all. Hobbes believed that the solution to this chaos was that people make a social contract that hands all, hands all individual rights over to the sovereign, the king, who agrees to protect them. Or, or sorry. Uh, agrees to protect them. Our obligation is then to follow whatever rules the leader makes. The rules, Hobbes believed, are entirely man-made. There is, there is no higher standard to judge them by. Any rights that people have after that are those granted by the sovereign. Opposed to Hobbes, was the emerging push for democracy in England. Uh, in England. Uh, democracy found its voice ultimately in the work of John Locke, another 17th century English philosopher who argued that while it is true that people are generally motivated by pleasure and pain, civil laws are based on natural law, which has a divine origin. This means that there is always a higher standard above the civil law of a given society by which we can judge it to be good or bad. For example, for example, Hitler's actions in Nazi Germany were all legal according to their own law, but the allies against him judged 
the Nazis by, by what they took to be a higher standard being legal on the view of uh, being legal on this view is not the same as being moral. Yes. All right. Thomas Jefferson was influenced by Locke when he wrote the Declaration of Independence that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Locke has written of the basic rights of life, liberty, and property, and that's the way Jefferson's earliest drafts of the de Declaration were written. It was Benjamin Franklin who advised Jefferson that pursuit of happiness would work better in that context. Sorry, losing my power here. Let's hope this gets done soon. Locke's major break from the past uh, was introducing a de democratic theory of rights. Locke based rights on property because without property, there would be no injustice, or there could be no injustice, he argued. However, that, however, that we are born with certain rights that could not be taken away from us because they are naturally or natural or God given. Yeah, but I think he used the property argument because he also was pro-slavery and viewed people and things as such as property. Ain't that just a bitch? All right. Are we still in focus? Okay, good. But I've lost my place. As God given. Do, do, do. Okay, there we are. Locke argued that we all possess our own minds and bodies from birth and have property rights regarding them. Hmm. So our own body, we have rights to our own body. That sounds like something we should have in, in uh, codified in law. This is the basis of such rights as free speech and the guarantee of equal protection under the law. He went further and importantly argued that we own our labor and the pro and the products of our labor. These rights are universal human rights. This meant that the only way to not be entitled to the products of our own labor would be to contractually negotiate away that right for some form of payment. Oh, capitalism. It was on this basis that Jefferson knew and wrote that slavery was wrong. That's ironic. Even though he was a slave owner himself. Sometimes the mental realization of an idea leads the way to its latter. Ultimate physical um, actualization, even if the initial dreamers don't quite live up to those ideas themselves. Working in the English Hobbesian hedonistic tradition in the 18th century, philosopher Jeremy Bentham believed he could develop a rational hedonistic history of ethics. He called his approach the utilitarian theory of ethics. He's also like the father of like uh, prison, kind of. They, they use his whole thing on justifying the prison system. But I digress. Utilitary to, bleh, utilitarianism is the theory that one should always act on that which creates the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. This is called the greatest happiness principle. As hedonists, utilitarians believe that happiness is brought about by maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Immanuel Kant, 18th century German philosopher, posed a moral theory based on autonomy, rational universability, and respect for persons with the ultimate idea of society being 
a kingdom of ends. Autonomy is the exercise of the power to self-legislate, i.e. to have control over your own life. Auto is a Greek word meaning self, and nomos is the word for law. One charge against Bentham's utilitarianism was that it propose is that his proposal would lead to human beings living like pigs. Kant rejected hedonism, thinking that even animals seek pleasure and avoid pain. Following Aristotle, Kant emphasized that what makes humans unique in our rationality or is our rationality. Being autonomous involves rational deliberation and choice. Without it, we are slaves to the pleasures and pains that push and pull us this way and that. Think of Plato's allegory of the chariot. On this basis, Kant argued that the experience of pleasure and pain and calculations based on this is not a moral aspect of our lives. While many people see morality as restrictive, keeping us from indulging in our desires, Kant saw morality as liberating us from being slaves to our passions. So morality is possible because human beings have the freedom to make choices. It's our choice that it's our choices that are judged as moral or immoral. Kant argued that the only thing that can truly be said to be good is a good will. By will, Kant meant the deciding part of our mind, which can be compared with that with what Plato called the spirit in his allegory of the chariot. What many good people in history who have been admired for their virtue have had in common is a willingness to harmonize their individual will with that Jean-Jacques Rousseau called the general will. Legislative laws, argued Rousseau, are based on such a general will which aims for the common good. Kant called the general will within us the moral law. Holy shit, this goes on forever. Two, rational universability is a principle that was applied to one of us uh, should uh, uh, is the principle that what applies to one of us should apply to everyone in every circumstance. Well, that's stupid. We say that we are equal before the law. Following Aristotle, Kant emphasized that what emphasized that what makes human beings unique is our rationality, not the pleasure seeking and pain avoidance that we share with our with other animals. Kant believed that ethics should be more like science, discovering universal principles just as natural philosophy proposed laws of nature. He believed that due to our rational nature, we can discern both the order of nature outside of us and the moral law within us. The moral law is universal, applying everywhere to everyone, Kant believed, and it imposes a duty or obligation upon us. If we want to achieve an ordinary task in life, such as getting a driver's license, there are certain things you must do to get it, such as taking, a written, taking written and driving tests and passing an eye exam. Kant called these hypothetical imp imperatives, hypothetical imperatives, because they're only bound by, we're only bound by them if we want to achieve a certain goal, but it's different in morality. The moral law is expressed as a categorical imperative, meaning it is our obligation categorically without exception. The moral law is binding to us no matter what. The logical expression of the moral law as a categorical imperative, according to Kant, is act only according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. This can be imperative. Sorry, this can be interpreted to mean that one should only act according to maxims or rules that we could rationally 
without contradiction, want everyone else to do. Kant used the example of false promises, which is a kind of lying. You should never lie, Kant said, because you, you could not want everyone else to lie. To begin with, if everyone treated lying as a general rule or moral law, the whole purpose of telling a lie would be negated. No one would believe you when you told your lie. Lies would only work when people expect you to tell the truth. Also, one lies to gain an advantage of some sort. But if everyone lied, it would be to the advantage of no one. So to say that everyone should lie contains an internal contradiction. But if everybody lies and they all have to lie, then you could probably reasonably deduce that maybe the opposite of what they're saying or some other thing on the adjacent area of what they're saying would actually be true because in your head you know we all lie and we all have to lie in this scenario obviously but I digress again the moral expression of the categorical imperative according to Kant is that one should always treat others as ends in themselves and never as means only Everyone has a role and that potential and the potential to fulfill their own purposes or ends. Therefore, Kant concluded that to treat others as a means only is to harm others by putting your own interests and desires ahead of theirs and set up in a way that opposes theirs. Therefore, one could argue that one shouldn't lie because lying is based on treating others as means to your own ends rather than treating them as ends in themselves. That's not a bad way to look at it. Kant called an ideal society created by such a harmony of individual wills with the general will, the kingdom of ends. Critical thinking and counterexample. A counterexample is a refutation of an argument by an opposing example. A counter argument is a refutation of an argument by an opposing argument. The single quickest way you can learn to be a better critical thinker is to get into the habit of always looking at the other side of the argument, whether it's through counter example or counter argument. In the end, you might not think the counter example or counter argument uh, successfully challenges the original claim or argument, but at least you will have tried it out. For example, one person might be for abortion rather than just might be for abortion rather than just accept it rather than just accepting what they are saying immediately, we need to look at the argument against it. You might end up agreeing with the abortion rights proponent in the end, but you'll be more informed when you really understand both sides of the story. Freedom isn't just going along with whatever you're told. Our personal freedom is based on making informed choices. The habit of thinking of and looking for counterexamples and counterarguments helps us to make more informed choices and to be better critical thinkers. Socrates, the great father of Western philosophy, introduced some of these skills and famously said that the unexamined life is not worth living. It can be argued that we cannot develop our individuality based on freedom without developing these critical thinking skills. Returning to Kant then, one potential problem with the universal ability uh, aspect of his theory is pointed out by a counterexample involving the story of the madman with a knife if you saw someone fleeing from a, from a madman with a knife and the madman asked you where the fleeing person went what would you tell this crazy person with a knife what would uh, what would be the right thing to do? Suppose you couldn't ignore them. Suppose the madman threatened you. Should you tell the truth? Should you lie? If you should lie in this situation, you're deciding that you don't agree with Kant's uh, 
deontological or duty-based theory. Kant says situationalism involves predicting consequences and predicting consequences is not part of moral reasoning. To do something because it will work out for someone in the end, a matter of prudence rather than morality. Lying is still immoral, Kant argues. One could argue that it is more important to do what is right than it than what is prudent, but that begs the question of what is right in this case. Is it right to save a life or right not to lie? One could agree that because Kant doesn't allow for questions of priority with regard to either duties or consequences, this theory is in need of modification. Yes. Other ethics say, ethicists, ethicists say circumstances and, and consequences matter greatly, as opposed to detonologists where uh, they're called consequentialists. Who gives a shit what they're called? Jesus Christ. It's the outcome consequences that matters more than the intention, they would argue. If you told the truth to the madman and the innocent person got killed, the murderer would be partly your fault. The murder would be partly your fault. Okay. John Stuart Mill was a utilitarian ethicist who agreed with Bentham that one should always do what leads to the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Applying this utilitarian principle would save the potential victim of the madman with the knife. One could tell a lie if it were going to lead to more people being safe in the end. Counterexamples create potential problems for utilitarian theory as well. However, let's consider the lifeboat counterexample. Suppose you survive a sinking ship in a life raft, but conclude that your supplies will not, will not last long enough to get you to safety. There you are in the middle of the ocean. You, you have, say, 10 people in your lifeboat, and you conclude you may only have enough food and water to get seven to safety. Should you allow all 10 to die, or should you choose three people to throw overboard. Someone might volunteer to go overboard as, as a heroic action, sacrificing themselves or others. This raises the question of whether suicide is in such a case is permissible. Kant's moral theory wouldn't allow for it. If for no other reason that it shows a lack of respect for your own uh, value as a person. But suppose no one volunteers, suppose there were among those on the lifeboat a senior citizen, someone who is irritating and unhelpful, and someone who is physically or mentally challenged, challenged in some way. The majority might decide after debating the point that those are the three who should die in order to save the rest. Under the utility, yeah, kill the annoying person. That's, that's cool. Under the utilitarian theory, this would seem to be acceptable. It is a sacrifice of the few for the good of the many. Don't you quote Spock on me. But many people do not agree with this reasoning. Despite these counterexamples, there are many detonological and utilitarian ethicists all around the world today, all trying to figure out ways to handle such problems. Consider continuing your studies of ethics to learn about later approaches. At the end of the 19th and beginning of the last century, the American philosopher Josiah Royce, there's his birth and death dates, developed a modern virtue theory of ethics, hearkening back to Plato, Aristotle, and early Christian ethics. Josiah Royce proposed an ethics of loyalty. Royce argued that the development of virtue centers around loyalty to causes. He thought that this can begin with loyalty to anything. A major reason for the development of his theory was his realization that our biggest moral issues are often moral dilemmas involving competing moral interests. This begins individual individually when we mature, we struggle with competing loyalties even within ourselves. Re resolving these competing loyalties teach, 
teaches us the skills necessary to later resolve competing loyalties in the community at large. One possible problem for this theory comes in question, comes in the question, loyal to what? Wasn't the Nazi movement all about loyalty to the fatherland? Aren't terrorists and gang members loyal to their causes? Yes, Royce says. He used the example of pirates and said that even pirates develop admirable virtues within their own community as a result of their loyalties. Pirates weren't really loyal to much, to be honest. In the end, Royce believed that people have the possibility of maturing and realizing that, they, that the key to the good life comes through overcoming conflicts of loyalties. He said the test of a good life or the test of a good cause is that it allows you to act upon a loyalty to loyalty itself. Royce considers this to be equivalent to what Christians refer to as agape or a love uh, uh, given to all without exception and or of what would be given back. So, you know, unconditional love. Royce's test of good or good causes, loyalty to loyalty, meant that everyone should be able to pursue their own causes without pre preventing others from doing the same. The justice system and military action come into play, he believed, when it is necessary to stop people who are impeding others' freedoms to pursue those causes, not otherwise. So, you know, your freedom ends where my, you know, freedom begins, I guess in those boundaries. Another major ethical theory developed in the 20th century was also a development of or from virtue ethics by W.D. David Ross. Ross was a deontologist, deontologist that like Kant, who or but was critical of Kant's suggestion that one's duties are absolute. Instead, Ross argued that there are seven prima facie duties or obligations that we all have. Fidelity, reparation, gratitude, justice, uh, beneficence, benefit, I can't, that word, benefence, self-improvement, and non mal <clears throat> malfeasance beneficence and okay now i know what it says beneficence self-improvement and non non-malfeasance in the end however one must choose between these in a given context ross however does not give us a rule to choose which duty is the all things considered duty he believes we must find our way in the final decision through intuition. Alfred North Whitehead and John Dewey both proposed an aesthetic ethics. We could consider this an answer to what we're looking for in the ethical institution or intuition Ross pointed to. Whitehead's aesthetic ethics argues that the good is beautiful um, or is the beautiful understood as harmony within um, intensity of contrast. An artwork can harmon can harmonious in a boring way. What? That's not a sentence. A canvas painted completely white could be harmonious, but unimaginative and uninspiring. Adding adding intensities of contrast while maintaining harmony seems to be the goal and much of the same could or same thing could be said for life as we seek the beautiful outcome or beautiful life in a sense i believe kant's ethics can be saved by these modifications kant's univer universability principle gives us the most trouble i will come back to that but the moral principle of respect for persons is pretty jesus christ widely acknowledged and necessary to ethics this is the fucking longest goddamn second chapter ever and it's all just ugh okay i'll get to that never mind anyways 
Royce is building on that principle in his teachings that we need to respect the causes of our neighbor, of our neighbors and that a good cause never prevents our neighbors from achieving their own causes. Royce is suggesting, however, that we have a duty to inhibit or stop bad causes that crush the dreams of our neighbors. If we could all follow this, Royce believed we could reach what he called the beloved community. Martin Luther King Jr. adopted and adapted this phrase, beloved community, many times himself. Ross recognized that we often have competing duties in the pursuit of such causes. We need to prioritize them situationally, and this involves, in the end, an intuition to decide between, you, between them. Using Whitehead's aesthetic method, we then can aim for a beautiful, for as beautiful a life and as beautiful a world as we can, remembering that the beautiful is, compri is comprised of harmony and intensity of values. And it's also very subjective. If we combine these four views, we can look again at the madman with the knife counterexample. The madman is clearly not respecting the personhood of the innocent person he is attacking. The madman is as an enemy of the general principle of loyalty in the case in this case and must be stopped. We have a duty of seeking justice and practicing nomalfeasance that outstrips any duty to tell the truth in this case. How do we know this? Our intuition leads us to seek beautiful world to seek a beautiful world and a world in which murders, murderers have their way is not a beautiful one. There is an argument to be made that utilitarianism is the method that should be used with, um, in no-win situations. We should all, or we should call this triage utilitarianism. In medical situations where there are a lack of supplies one is often forced to, into a strategy that may knowingly lose the lives of some for the sake of saving the greater number of lives. This could be applied as the defense of utilitarianism in the lifeboat counterexample. But it seems clear that if our other moral principles are true, one has to be at, at the least very certain that there are no other options available to save all the lives. Trying to save the universability aspect of Kant's theory may be a stretch, but if we take this enlarged, modified view of the of a Kantian-based ethic into, into account, we could say that its method involves a rational principle that must be universally applied. Whether we accept the views of any of these principal uh, particular philosophers or not, in the, um, it is important to be able to reason about what is good as well as what is true. Philosophy using the tools of logic and critical thinking helps us do that. Critical thinkers need to learn to be wise, not only knowing facts about the world, but how to use the knowledge in the right way. Holy shit, that was a, that was a lot to get through. And a lot of really no basis for what is actually going to be getting taught. I mean, it gives you a brief, a brief touch on some uh, things that have to do with, with critical thinking. However, there's a lot more that isn't covered. And to be honest, um, there, there really should, he should just really just get into critical thinking, giving you a background on, on different philosophical theories is somewhat, in, somewhat irrelevant in, in the aspect of learning the art of thinking critically. You don't need to know what, what Kant thought. You don't need to know so much about that not yet anyways you can get into that later but to have an understanding of just what it means to think critically 
and what is an argument and and what are ethics I mean I don't know that was a rough read that was really rough but we made it we made it through that the first two chapters and honestly um let's hope the other chapters are better um because the textbook that I had for a um for my critical thinking course was much better and I think they probably had a a, a better editor that made sure that these sentences were better structured and less typographical errors but that's just me and I apologize for some of the mispronunciations. I'll get better at figuring those ones out. But this is the first time I read it. So I didn't read it before. So I didn't know some of these random words in here. Well, they're not that random. But they're complicated. Anywho, I hope you enjoyed this uh, book. Well, we made it for the first two chapters. So we're there. And we're going to get to the second. Or sorry. Sorry, we're going to get to the third chapter soon. But for now, that's it. Good night.